Hey folks, well, I'm going to talk about waves. Waves are one of the most enduring motifs in science. Probably the first waves that were ever observed were on the surface of water. And what we found is that these waves are oscillating up and down and moving. Uh, that's one of the properties of many waves, that they will propagate through space. And the height above the baseline from which they oscillate like this, that's called the amplitude. And this type of wave is called the transverse wave that we see on water, for example. You can have the same type of wave, a transverse wave, when you take a rope and you go like this, and you see the wave propagate through space. And what happens is the oscillation is perpendicular to the direction of motion. And that's characteristic of a transverse wave. Another type of wave is called a compression wave. That's what happens in air. When you go like this, the molecules of air get compressed and rarefied, and that causes them to push and pull other molecules, and they propagate forward. So in a compression wave, the oscillation is parallel to, in the same direction as, the propagation of motion. And these are the two basic uh, types of waves. There are also waves that are called standing waves. They stand. They don't move around. For instance, if you take a big pot, and you fill it with water to make spaghetti, but before you put spaghetti in, you tap it, you'll see concentric circles, and those concentric circles are waves, and they're going to be oscillating up and down. And what happens is, by tapping on the pot, you're putting energy into the pot, and that energy is being used to make these standing waves. Standing waves can also be acoustic in sound. That's why when you sing in the shower, it sounds better, except if you're Nick Gisburn. And what happens is, in the shower, in the bathroom, the walls are a certain space apart, and what that does is it creates standing waves. Now, it turns out that these concepts, these basic concepts of waves, repeat themselves on all scales, all sizes, and through all different types of phenomena in science. For instance, when we discovered that light can be both a wave and a particle, we said, oh, that's cool, it can be a wave. It's traveling through space, so it must be traveling through a substance. So there must be a substance out there in space, and we call that substance the ether. But then we discovered that there wasn't a substance out there, that light was propagating through space. And we found out that what was going on is that light was made of electromagnetism. And electromagnetism was a form of energy. And Einstein told us that energy and matter were two forms of the same thing. And what that means is, is that it was okay, but unexpected, for light to behave as a pure energy form. But we dealt with that. But then along came some very, very weird behavior. We started to explore what atoms look like. And we started to look at the orbitals of atoms. Orbitals are where the electrons live, and we define these orbitals as places where volumes around the nucleus, the center of the atom, where we can find an electron about 95% of the time. That's what an orbital is. But guess what type of equations we used, yes, to describe where the electron will be? Absolutely, we used wave equation, and we called it wave mechanics, known as quantum mechanics. And it was cool stuff, except it was weird. And let me tell you how it was weird. We discovered that we could not know the position and the momentum. That's mass times velocity is momentum. So if you have a big truck and it's moving really fast, you've got a lot of momentum, m times v. Okay? We couldn't know the position or the momentum of an electron with precision, both at the same time. We couldn't. Heisenberg came up with that. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But what's really strange is, we couldn't know this, not because of our inability to find out, but we have proven unequivocally, absolutely, that we can't find out because that information is not there. In other words, until we make a measurement, until we go ahead and look at that electron, by having that electron strike something and making a mark, which we can observe, like on an old-fashioned television screen, that's how they work, they're called cathode ray tubes, until that happens, that electron does not have an, a precise momentum or position. And how we choose to ask the question, whether we ask whether we have the position down exactly or the momentum, depends what we get. 
And all of this stuff is very, very, very weird. Now, where this led to was a whole study of what's called quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics is generally considered the study of the very small. But that's not true. It turns out that quantum mechanics can exist to things of any size. And it appears that the world of QM is everywhere around us. It's just that, as I mentioned before, my previous vid, that because we have all this QM going on, it appears to be perfectly normal. But more and more cases are occurring where we're observing what it's not. And let me explain to you how it can be not perfectly normal. When a quantum event occurs, we say it is a-causal. It does not have a cause. Now, certainly this can bring in ideas about how the universe started in God and all that, but what I'm saying is that's awful weird. Because from now on, I mean, to think of things not having a cause, that is just weird. Quantum mechanics is said to be probabilistic. What it means is, is that what particles do cannot be predicted precisely, but can be predicted with an extremely precise prob probability. For instance, I can say there's a 60% chance of A and a 40% chance of B exactly, but I can't predict what will happen in any one case. And this is very, very strange because to have these, this world we live in of particles and suddenly we're dealing with this quantum mechanical stuff, and I need to explain that all this comes about because of wave equations. The solutions for wave equations deal with probability. When we take the amplitude of a wave and we square it, we get, in normal cases, we get intensity. Uh, that's how bright the light is. But when we do it for electrons or for other quantum objects, we get something called the probability density. That is the probability of finding an electron within a given volume. And a lot of quantum mechanics works just like that, where we don't know things exactly. Now, what that does is it presents a really interesting question. Is it really a causal? Is that just the way the universe is? Can we accept that? And there was a guy by the name of Hugh Everett. He was a graduate student of the great John Wheeler who came up with something called Any World Hypotheses. And Niels Bohr didn't like it and made him tame down his thesis because it went against what Niels Bohr thought. And it, it turned out that Hugh Everett left science and made a bundle of money uh, in industry and then drunk himself to death as a very unhappy man at an early age. And that's the story. But his many world hypothesis was absolutely cool. And here's what it essentially says. It says the world is deterministic. When a quantum event is going to occur, in other words, we want to know whether a nuclei is going to have radiation. It's going to decay or not. We want to know what an electron will do. We want to know what particles, when they interact, what they will do. All of these are probabilities. What, what Wheeler said is every time one of these events occurs, and there's gazillion, gazillion, gazillion of these happening all the time, every single time that happens, everything that can happen does happen and splits into different universes. Now, what's interesting about that is that is deterministic, not probabilistic. Because what it means is, is that it's perfectly symmetrical. You know exactly what's going to happen. It's not like there's a probability of it. Everything happens. And you can't say, well, why did this happen to me in this universe? And, you know, why? Well, the answer is, everything happened to you. There's no asymmetry. If an event occurs, that event occurs everything happens, in other words, and then everything splits. So before the event, there was only one you, so nothing happened to some other you. You were you, and that's all there is to it. That's what many worlds is, is all about. Now, one of the problems with many worlds, if you kind of got that idea, is um, how does that 60-40 thing work? Let's say 60-40. Now, this is something I created, not because I'm incredibly brilliant, but only because I'm brilliant is um, my thinking would be that the number of universes would be quantized. There would be a fixed number, and if you have 60-40, 60% of the universes go one way, 40% of the universes go the other way, and, and that would be kind of the idea. But let me explain how cool this concept is and what the problem with 
it is. The cool idea is that every time there's an interaction that would normally be probabilistic, 60-40, what happens is everything happens, you get 60-40, and it can be a lot more complicated than that because usually there's hundreds of possibilities, and then all these universes are kind of constantly being occurring. Now, some people say, that's nuts, there's too many universes, it's crazy. And it is kind of crazy until you think that maybe everything is just a bunch of waves. One of the things about waves is they all kind of overlap and it can move through each other without affecting each other, but when they kind of probabilities go up, probabilities go down. If you know about how the equations for waves work, this idea of having essentially one multiverse that is just a whole bunch of waves interacting and completely deterministic is totally cool to me, and I'm running out of time, but damn, this was fun, and I guess I'll probably talk more later. See ya.